Hallelujah. First, I want to give honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Then to the best pastor and first lady. I mean, we have an awesome pastor and first lady. And he sends his love. Um, he is not here today, but Sister Shantae and I um, have a word from the Lord that we're going to deliver on today. You may have your seat. You may take a seat. Um, however, he will be here on Sunday to um, hear from him again. So tonight, I am speaking um, from Habakkuk 2 and 2 through 4. Habakkuk 2, chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. And my topic is faith beyond experiences. And before I dwell into um, my theme chapter, because I'm not going to read that just yet, but before I dwell into that, I want to give you just a little bit of history on, um, a little background, I should say, on Habakkuk. It's a, you know, it's a small uh, chapter, small book. It only has three chapters. But in chapter one, um, Habakkuk is actually complaining. So he's complaining, and he's complaining about the injustice that he sees. He's like, God, I know that you see the wickedness of my people. It is widespread and it's bad. I mean, violence everywhere. Sin is everywhere. The people love to argue and fight. That comes in verse 3. They have no regard for the law, and they abuse the law. And the number of wicked far outnumber those of us who are righteous. So basically, Habakkuk was complaining about the people. He was like, man, these people are pretty bad. When I was reading, I'm like, man, it reminded me of the theme um, from cops, bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? It's like, he was like, God, what you gonna do? What you gonna do? And he was seeing all of this sin and he wanted God to take note of it. And he wanted God to do something about the people um, not having reverence for his laws and his principles. So Habakkuk did have a relationship with God. He knew God well enough to know that God was not detached from, the people, from people's ungodliness. And he just wanted to know when God was going to do something about what was going on. So God gives him an answer. God answers his complaint. He says, Habakkuk, I got you, I got you, Habakkuk. He said, I'm going, if I told you what I was going to do, you wouldn't believe it even if somebody else told you about it. He said, I, God said, I am going to send the Babylonians who are notorious, cruel, and evil people, and they are going to do what I want them to do. Well, Habakkuk really didn't like that. He was like, wait a minute, you're going to send people who are worse off then the people that you, come in, that, you, that you are coming to punish, you're going to send people to destroy us who are worse off than us? And so he actually, Habakkuk actually was really upset with that answer. And he, he told God, he said, God, they are going to take delight in destroying us, delight in, in capturing us. And are you just going to stand there and let them succeed? Forever? So God answers Habakkuk again. And this is where, my, where our theme scripture comes in. And, I, and, I, and I'm in Habakkuk 2, 2 and 4, um, the um, New Living trans Translation. He says, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. The vision is for a future time it describes the end and it will be fulfilled. For it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for surely it will take place. It will not be delayed. Look at the proud, this is verse four, look at the proud. They trust in themselves, their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faith. 
the righteous will live by their faith. So again, my topic is faith beyond experiences. And as we go back to Habakkuk's experiences, he was actually experiencing or he was seeing things because within that chapter, he never said anything that was actually happening to him personally. But he was just talking about how the pe people were wicked and um, how there was sin everywhere, strife and contention, people fighting, people love fighting. Um, you know, I'm always amazed at people who on, on their Facebook page like share people fighting. I'm like, man, it reminds I'm like, man, these must be some of the people that love to fight. Um, but you know that the people, there were people who had a disregard for the law, people just, you know, allergic to being good citizens. And all of those, God, he, he questions God. But we know from his questions that he actually had a, Habakkuk actually had a relationship with God because he knew the nature of God. He talked about, he said, Lord, in verse 2, in verse 2 he says, Lord, how long, O Lord, must I call for help? So he, so he knew God as a helper. He said, violence is everywhere. I cry out to you, but you do not come and save. So he knew him as a protector. And in verse 4, there seems no justice in the courts, and the wicked far outnumber the righteous. So the justice is perverted. So he knew him as a righteous and holy God. Yet in his experiences, or the experiences that he saw affected his faith. God answered um, Habakkuk's first complaint. God basically told him, he said, I am going to allow, as I said earlier, I am going to allow the Babylonian people who are even more wicked, I am going to allow them to destroy. That's like, when I was reading this and doing my research, that's like having the maximum security prisoners come and oversee the county jail. That's what it was like the with the Babylonians. So, uh, Habakkuk took issue with God's response, and he counted himself because he was like, God, I'm, you know, you're going to let the, you're going to let them destroy us righteousness people, us righteous people. And he also indicated that the number outweighed the righteous, the wicked outweighed the right, righteous. And since he was righteous, why did Habakkuk fall, or why did his faith deflate? I mean, Habakkuk he talked about he was righteous, so he allowed what he saw to affect his faith. Like, God, what you going to do? You going to do something? When you going to do it? He allowed his experience around him to affect those experiences or to have experiences that weren't even his. So there were some experiences that he looked upon that really affected his faith. And he allowed the knowledge of God, even though he knew God, he allowed those experiences that he saw, not even the ones that affected him. He allowed those experiences that he saw to affect how he saw God. It got to the point where he questioned God's um, response to the wicked and, the, and what he saw with his natural eyes. Habakkuk's faith was so deflated that he lodged a second complaint. You are sending Babylon, a nation, to take care of us. And listen to what he says in Habakkuk 1 and 13. He says, he, and he, I mean, at this point, Habakkuk had an attitude. He was like, you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked shallow and swallow up more righteous than they? When I was reading this, I was like, Habakkuk, go get my belt. Because, I mean, he had much attitude. I, as I continued to do the research in chapter 1, he even continued his attitude in chapter 1. Chapter 2, excuse me, verse 1. He had the nerve to say, uh, will I climb up to the watchtower and stand at my guard post? There will I wait to see what the Lord will says and how he will answer my complaint. 
I was like, Habakkuk, take back the belt and get the bag. Because how are you now going to say, I'm going to stand at the watchtower and watch and see how you're going to answer my complaint? A complaint that he lodged himself because of his defla def deflated faith. So you're questioning God. Have much attitude because you allowed something that wasn't personally affecting you. Like you were seeing people get away with stuff and you were upset with that. And because of that, you question God and then you say, I'm going to watch and see what you're going to say or how you're going to handle it. But God being a loving and merciful God, he, when he answered Habakkuk, he said so calmly and clearly, he's like, Habakkuk, go get, go get something to write with. <laughs> write this down. Because Habakkuk has been, he had forgotten all the things that God had done. So what God is saying is, you know, write it down, plainly on a tablet, so that runners can carry it, the correct message to others, the vision is for a future time. It describes the end, it will be fulfilled. The vision is for a future time. So Habakkuk couldn't see it, or maybe at one time he could see it, but the faith that he allowed to be deflated cast a shadow over his eyes and he could no longer see what God was doing. God's word says, if it seems slow in coming, wait patiently for it, for surely, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Look at the proud. And then God took, a, took time out to say, okay, I see. He said, look at the proud. They trust in themselves. Their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by the faithfulness of God. And if we are honest, there have been some times where we had like a Habakkuk experience. Like, God, I've been tithing and sowing, and there are some people that can't even spell tithing. Now, there's a lady that I've been trying to get to come to KCC for two years, and she just got a raise and a promotion. And then, God, and then they complain. Then another one, God, I've been going, I'm going to the doctor again. I've been having tests after tests. I, they can't figure out what's going on. My body is being attacked in another area. When, is this, when this test is clear, there's another test. And then there's another test. Lack of faith. That's another experience. And then God, she, not, <clears throat> she or he is not even thinking about you in their singleness. They all hugged up on Facebook and Twitter, <laughs> living with their boyfriend, with their girlfriend, and finally get married, and now they, we married on, you know, on Facebook. <laughs> Habakkuk experiences being, you know, we're being clouded by it. So there are three things that you can do to have faith beyond your experiences. Three things that you can do. The first one, and Elder Sekou say this to the kids all the time, is keep your faith on 100. Like, you got to keep it way up there. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 and 17. You must ensure that you hear and see more word than the experiences around you. So the more experiences you see, the more word that you have to pour in. Because it's those experiences that you view are the, are the experiences that affect and deflate, can affect and deflate your faith. So if you're in a battle, you have to turn up the word in your life. If you have a sickness and it's continuously, um, uh, if you're battling a sickness and you're really battling with it, you have to turn up the word in your life. Every moment of it. You have to get the, the scriptures on healing. Pull them out. You have to say them. I used to, point, and I still do, post things. I couldn't even see my mirror. I had so many scriptures posted on it. But you have to be able to, to set those things up so that you can always be, in, you know, so that they're always in your eyesight and they're always in your hearing. Number two, live 
by your faithfulness to God. Without faithfulness to God, you cannot have a Christian life. Faithfulness to God is based on faith that is God through Jesus Christ, who, were we, who we were forgiven and reconciled to him and saved. Faithfulness is a commitment to adhere to the, only and, to the one and only true God and stick to the things of God. So you have to stay faithful to God. The third thing that you have to do in order to have faith beyond your experiences is one that pastor says over and over again, and I put it in here because it is so, so true. You have to hear the word, read the word, do the word, and pray in the spirit. Habakkuk is... He is he he actually um, is semi permissible in his questioning to God. So it's there was part of it that was respectful, and then there was part of it where he, in my opinion, he was just he really let the experiences that he had affect him. Sometimes it's not the evidence that's going on to us that affects our faith especially if we're thrown in into suffering for a period of time or if it seems like our enemies are prospering or we are just barely getting by with something. In those three short chapters, Habakkuk affirms that God is sovereign. And actually in chapter three is when Habakkuk comes up with enough strength to remember who God was, to remember that God is mightier than all, and to remember that God knows all. But Habakkuk affirms that God is sovereign and omnipotent God, and that he has all things under control. We just need to be still and know that God is at work. We need to know that God is who he said he is, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. And what he says, he will do. Our father keeps his promises. He will punish the wicked. Like, we don't even have to worry about that. He, they're going to get what comes to them. But even when we can't see it, he is still on the throne. We did not get to, we, I didn't get to really get into chapter three, but Habakkuk begins at that point to actually um, sing a prayer to God. And he states all the things about God. He said, Lord, I am filled with the all of your amazing works. So he took what he already knew and he remembered what God had done. He said, Lord, I am filled in all by your amazing works. In Habakkuk 3 and 19, and this is the amplified version, he says, Lord God, the Lord God is my strength, my source, of, my source of courage, my invincible army. He has made my feet steady and sure like hind's feet and makes me walk forward with spiritual confidence. On my high places or changed in, and changed in responsibility. A hind is a female deer, and deers have the ability to set their front feet and their back feet in the exact same space. And then they're able to run fast and elude the enemy. And so when, when it says here that it talks about um, he has made my feet steady and sure like Hans' feet and makes me walk forward with spiritual confidence on high places, and those are places of change and responsibility. God has, has us. He has you. And all you have to do is to remind yourself when you get into difficult areas, remind yourself what God has already done. 
what he has already done. He has already provided a way. If he does it once, he can do it again, or he will do it again. So in, in conclusion, you have to have faith beyond, exper beyond the experiences that you see. You have to have more word than the experiences that you see or the experiences that you actually go through. And God, God has the ability and he will deliver us every single time. Like we always have the victory. There is never a time that we lose. Like 100% of the time we win. Like there is never an opportunity to lose. Every, I mean, every single thing that you have, you can win, like yes. Every time you can win, yes. You can conquer this every time, yes. It, the answer is never no. And so God has the ability to push us beyond and, and carry, us, carry us beyond our experiences. Thank you. Let's keep standing, give God some glory, honor, and praise. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Did Minister White do an awesome job laying out the word for us on this evening? Amen, amen. Uh, but God, who is so rich in mercy, he loved us so much that even when we were dead in our sins, he gave us life when he allowed Jesus Christ to be raised from the dead. So it is only by God's grace that we are saved. Let's give our mighty God a great praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. He is awesome. We honor him on this evening. Thank you, Lord. Glory to your name. He is so worthy to be praised. So worthy. Let's give honor to our awesome pastor, Pastor Rogers, in his absence on this evening. Um, of course, our beautiful First Lady, let's give her honor as well. And if you would indulge me, I honor the Lord of my home, Deacon Martin, on this evening as well. <laughs> you may be seated. Um, KCC family, did we not have just a tremendously, tremendously wonderful, wonderful just month of life groups and, and women's weekend? Uh, who's still just really jacked up off of just the wonderful time we've had? Amen, amen. Um, the word that I want to bring to us this evening is to really layer on top of that. I mean, we're flying high, so I want to give a word to allow us to layer on top of that. Let's turn in our Bibles to Joshua chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Joshua chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. The Bible reads, Then Joshua called the Reubenites, and the Gadites, and the half-tribe of, of Manasseh, and said unto them, Ye have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. Ye have not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren, as he promised them, Therefore now return ye and get you unto your tents and unto the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side, Jordan. Key scripture here. But take diligent heed to do the commandment of the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him that's Hold on, hold fast, hold tight, and to serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Let's look at a little background here, what we're talking about here in Joshua. Referring back to the first two verses, Joshua called the Reubenites, let's keep these groups of people in mind, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. 
He said to them, ye have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. Well, what is it that Joshua commanded them? Let's refer back to chapter 1. Go back to chapter 1 of Joshua, verses 12 through 15, and this is the New Living Translation. This is going to give us some instruction for what it is that Joshua actually instructed them. Then Joshua called together the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, same group of people. These are the same group in chapter 22. This is going back to chapter 1 where he called them. What did he tell them? He told them, remember what Moses, the servant of the Lord, told you. The Lord your God has given you a place of rest. He has given you this land. Your wives, children, and livestock may remain here in the land Moses assigned to you on the east side of the Jordan River. But here's the specific instruction. But your strong warriors, fully armed, they're supposed to be fully armed, must lead the other tribes across the Jordan to help them conquer their territory. Stay with them. More instruction, stay with them until the Lord gives them rest, as he has given you rest, until they too possess the land the Lord your God has given them. Only then, only then may you return and settle here on the east side of the Jordan River. Translation here, at this point, the Israelites had already, uh, the, no, the, the three groups, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they had already received some victory. They were resting. They, their area that had been assigned to them that uh, Moses had given unto them, the Lord had given unto them, was on the east side of the Jordan. So they're basically chilling out. They, they got their wives, their, laughs, their livestock. They're just chilling. But now Joshua's coming saying, you, you know, you're resting. You have what you need. But your brethren, who are the Israelites, they need some help. So you can sit there, you can, you can let your wives, let the vulnerable stay back, but let's get all your strong men. We're going to go and help the brethren out. And what you're going to do, you're going to go with them, you're going to help them, you're going to stay with them, you're not going to kowtow, go back and leave. My instruction to you is stay with your brethren until they get the victory. And only, not before, but only when they get rest can you go back and get rest. So that was the instruction. Now, let's go back and see, did they follow the instruction? Let's jump back to chapter 22, verse 3. Oh, ye have not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. So they did exactly what it was that Joshua had instructed them. He told them, don't leave them, and they did exactly that. They did not leave, and Joshua followed through with what he said, and now the Lord your God have given rest unto your brethren as he promised them. Now therefore return ye and get you into your tents and into the land of your possession, which Moses the servant have given you on the other side of Jordan. So they've already fought. They've won all these victories. They've helped their brethren win. Now they can go back. So it's important to um, focus on the warning here. We're getting ready to have a transition. We've had lots of fights, you know, we got rest going on. They won. I mean, chapter 22, this is at the, the end of all these battles. We've had great success. Joshua, we all know Joshua's knocking them all down. He's taking over territory after territory after territory. So now everybody's chilling, everybody's resting. But here's the warning. Joshua says, 22.5, but take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord your God, charged you, what should you take diligent heed to do? To love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments, to cleave, hold tight unto him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all of your soul. And we also, this was the instruction to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, but he also gave that same instruction um, in, in Joshua 23, 11, to the Israelites as well, he told them, take good heed, therefore, that ye love the Lord your God. That good heed is also translated diligent heed. So basically, Joshua has instructed both the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and he's instructed Israel that even though you have rest, you have to take heed to remain diligent unto what it is that the Lord has instructed you to do. So the posture here, Joshua is not instructing them from a place of weakness. 
He's not telling them to be diligent because um, they're trying to find a way out. They're still looking for a way to accomplish their goal. He, that's not it at all. He is admonishing them from a position of strength. They've already won. They've already gotten the victory. They're actually chilling out. But Joshua so strategically tells them, look, don't rest on your laurels. You have to make sure you stay diligent and do exactly what you're supposed to be doing, and you'll be able to accomplish what it is that God has told you to do. Now, let's look at just how good the, 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 the actual victory was. Look at Joshua 2145 in the New Living Translation. This is just a side piece that I thought was just really good. Now, here's, here's how the Bible describes the victory. Not a single one of all the good promises the Lord had given to the family of Israel was left unfulfilled. Everything he had spoken came true. Amen. And that's the praise break right there. Not one single promise, not one, was left unfulfilled. Everything God had promised had come true. So this is after the tribes won, got everything God promised, he still told them to hold fast to the Lord. Well, why did he tell them that? He wanted them to hold fast because, you know, we had a little history of a little idol, false idol worship. We had some history of doubt. We had some history of murmuring and complaining. So he said, you know, hey, we've got some victory here. Let's make sure we don't go, you know, go to the left now just because you're riding high. Let's not take down and start going back to your old ways and doing what you were doing before. And so that was the instruction he gave them to take diligent heed. Now let's focus on that word diligent because that's the key term here. We're talking about maintaining your diligence. Diligence means to be careful and persistent in work or effort, to be both careful and persistent. That means it's not enough to just be careful. It's not enough to just be persistent. You have to be both careful and persistent. I give the example of I, um, I learned for open, trying to open in a jar. You know, sometimes women, we have a little hard time opening jars. And there's this uh, interesting thing. I don't know how many people know about it. You can take a knife and hit, the, hit around the edge of the jar to open it. Well, I thought of that example. So if I'm trying to open a jar and I'm careful, if I take the knife and turn it the right way and hit it two times because I'm being careful, I don't want to cut myself, that's not going to open the jar. Okay, well, if I'm just persistent and I'm not hitting it on the right side of the, the knife and I'm just hitting it uh, a lot of times and it's not on the side that's actually sharp, even though I'm persistent, it's not going to accomplish my goal. If I'm not careful and I have the knife turned where it can cut me, I'm going to get hurt. So I have to be careful. If I'm careful and consistent, if I turn the knife the right way, I hit it repeatedly all around the edge, repeatedly all around the edge, then I'm going to accomplish my goal. That's an example of the importance of being both careful and persistent. Well, how do we relate that to what we have going on now? We are in a really high place as a church ministry, are we not? Amen. We have just come off of awesome services. We've had, just like the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half tribe of Manasseh, and the Israelites. We have come off of office deliverance service. How many people are still walking in their deliverance from the amazing <laughs> deliverance service that we had earlier this year? Um, how about married couples, the awesome marriage maintenance that we had, learning how to just maintain, amen, those, those tremendous things we've learned in our marriage maintenance. Um, singles, I heard your, your life group was awesome. Okay, why the singles louder than the married people? Come on, married people. <laughs> but yes, I mean, I understand just deliverance from wrong mindsets, some deliverance from um, relationships that should not be so um, flying high. And, and I call that victory, right? That's, that's victory. Ladies, oh my gosh, the tremendous goddess-themed life group. Yes, amen, amen. We really focused on letting go of wrong mindsets, uh, walking in forgiveness, um, not laboring in and being in self-condemnation at all. That's called what? Victory. Amen. We have victory. We also, oh my goodness, <laughs> the men, I understand your Conquer series, just really breaking some tremendously uh, bad mindsets, um, vices that's kind of keeping you back or was keeping you back. You've come through that. So we're talking about victory. 
Um, oh gosh, and we just can't say enough about our Women's Weekend, the Treasure Vessel. So, amen, amen, amen. Um, ladies, weren't we made to feel just so treasured and valued and so special? We call that, say it with me, victory. Amen. All of those. Um, and then we, 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 we have had victory individually in personal lives. I know there are people who have got the job of their life, like currently have the job of their life that they are, they are looking for, they want it. I know people in this ministry now who have experienced tremendous healing. I know people who've been looking for a job for a long time who just got a job, whose pay's been doubled. Um, even for our church. Come on, daily television for an eight-year-old church. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen, that is awesome. And then uh, we top it off with the tremendous word we got where we're gonna be walking in perpetual breakthrough, right? Perpetual breakthrough, I call that victory. That's victory. Well, here's the admonishment though. Just like Joshua admonished the Gadites, Reubenites, half tribe of Manasseh and the Israelites, we have to make sure that even though we've had this tremendously, tremendous, wonderful track record at the first part of the year that we don't take down, we remain diligent to focus on those things that God have instructed us to do. We remain diligent on showing love for God, diligent in following all his ways and his commandments, and we don't um, just sit back and take a faith vacation. <laughs> what does a faith vacation look like? Well... I don't have to be too pressed about the 9 a.m. cluster group because I've been in church a whole lot. It's okay if I take some mornings off. That's kind of taking a faith vacation, right? Um, 7.30 Kingdom Conversations, I was already kind of struggling a little bit. I'll take a break, you know, the next month because, you know, sunrise service, that was 6 o'clock, so that should make up for a couple 7.30 <laughs> Kingdom Conversations. So <laughs> I'll take a little break there. That's the faith vacation. Um, I've just gotten a lot of word. I mean, we have been in church a lot, to God be the glory. And for those of us who love church, it's been awesome, yeah. you know. But, you know, I, I don't have to listen to messages every day. I've heard a whole lot over the last couple of weeks, you know. That's, that's kind of a <laughs> bit of a faith vacation there. Um, and certainly, you know, we have Life Group coming up the third Sunday. We just been with the women all, all month long. We just... <laughs> Spent all Friday, Wednesday practice, Thursday church, Friday night, Saturday morning with the women. I really don't need to come this month on the third. You know, that's, <laughs> that's a faith vacation. And truly, those are some mindsets. You know, when you achieve victory and you riding high, sometimes it's a little hard to think that you need to keep on pressing in like you were before you got that victory. So those are ways, all of those ex are examples of taking a faith vacation. And what does that look like when you're not being diligent? Um, an example of not maintaining that diligence when you've e experienced some substantial weight loss. Well, I, I've, I've accomplished a lot, so I'm gonna really take an extra cup of cheat days. I'm gonna eat a little more than normal. That's not maintaining diligence. You, you've experienced some success, so I'm just gonna fall off a little bit, right? That's, that's, that, that's not maintaining diligence. Um, Husbands, you know, not dating your wife. We come out of marriage maintenance where pastor give us, okay, this the week we're going to do special things, and this the week we're going to do um, date your wife. We're going to put up pictures for this month, and then now that's over, and we're not doing it anymore. <laughs> right? That's, that's not maintaining that diligence, right? Because you, how many people, you know, if you're experiencing that success, that almost kind of euphoric feeling, Oh, we just so in love. It's been so awesome. We've been dating. And oh my goodness, oh, they bought me something. I bought him something. You feel so special. Y'all doing great. Well, that's because you were doing those things that created that experience. And when you're not doing it, you can't expect to continue to walk in victory there. Um, how about that thought stopping, ladies? How about the keychain? Right? Um, we have our scriptures on there. It sounded good all month long. I'm looking at my keychain. I got my keychain in my purse. And then you turn around, it's got, you know, lint on it. And, you know, you don't know where, because you're not looking at it. It's not front of mind anymore. That's not maintaining diligence. That's not the diligence there. And then how about this? Um, not subjecting yourself to accountability. Right? That's something we hear so much. Our pastor teaches us about the importance of discipleship and being accountable and, and being accountable to pastor to the word that's being preached. 
Well, it sounds all good and great when he preaches about it. I'm going to check in. I'm making sure. I'm going to call. I'm going to text. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to set the meeting when he gives us the instruction. But when he's not telling us no more and time has gone by, you know, well, we kind of fall off because nobody told me to do it. That's that, that's that diligence that we're missing. That's that going back, you know, the opposite of what Joshua told the groups that we, we need to make sure that we do. So, you know, I'm good now, so I don't need that much. You know, I got the help I needed, so I don't need it that much. Trick of the enemy, right? Right? How about not giving 110% at work because you got the job now? Right? I mean, that's something we really have to look at. We pray, oh, Lord. You give me this job, oh Lord, I'm just I'm believing God, I'm faithful, I'm ooh, hallelujah, praising Jesus. Oh, got the job, got the job, got the job. And then when you get in the job, you know, well, you know, I get there when I get there, or I ain't doing all that. I don't get paid to do that. <laughs> I ain't paying, I ain't that my job that ain't within my job description, right? But when you was believing God for the job, you know, you Lord, I'm gonna do anything you ask me to do. Just just let me get it, <laughs> right? That's that diligence. That's, that's the diligence. Um, oh, my goodness, when you're in crisis, you beating the church doors down. <laughs> you know, who can I talk to? Who can I call? I have crisis going on. I'm coming to every service. I'm coming to the stuff that don't apply to me. Um, you know, the women having something, I'm just, man, I'm going to just come stand in the back. Maybe somebody will use me at some point. I just want to be at church. <laughs> <laughs> well, that episodic kind of, that's not going to, you, you know, the crisis is over, you're just going to be in another crisis because you're not staying in that diligence. You're not, you know, making sure you're walking in God's commandments, staying in the house of God, really plugging in and focusing. And how about this one? It's finally over. The relationship that eh, probably shouldn't have been in to begin with. Whew, I'm out of it. It's finally over. But I'm not going to get rid of this piece of jewelry. I'm going to just hold on to that one. Or uh, this shirt, it's just a shirt. No big deal. Or I'm not going to really, you know, defriend them. Or, I don't know the right word for it, but all the social media, you know, because, you know, we're just still friends. We just kind of check and see how each other doing every now and then. Um, or just not taking a number out the phone altogether. That's still not being diligent. Right, that's kind of holding on to a little piece of it. I got some success. I got out of the relationship, but mm, I maintain that diligence because I'm just still holding on to a little piece. Those are examples of not maintaining diligence. And all those examples I gave, we're starting out in positions of strength. We have won. We've gotten deliverance. We are in victory. But then we don't maintain it. We don't, we don't stay focused. We don't maintain the diligence. We're not listening to the word. We're not constantly um, checking in with our discipleship. So those are the areas that we have to make sure that we don't fall prey to. As Joshua instructed all of those groups of people, even though you've had great victory, that is not the time to take down. We have to stay and remain diligent. Now, Sister, Sister Martin, you're talking about stuff from a position of strength. You know, what if I actually hadn't gotten victory yet? You know, you're talking about people who've been delivered for, from some things. I mean, that's still a lot of stuff I'm still dealing with. What, how am I supposed to deal with that? Diligence. <laughs> if you're in victory, you got to stay diligent. If you haven't had victory yet, you got to get diligent. Right? Amen. That's, you have to get diligent. Um, and... and, and that becomes so important because Satan tries to wear us down with doubt, right? That is his job. He is a professional at wearing us down, making it seem like this is never going to change. This is not going to be over. I've come through all of these services, and it's still here, still looking at me. Um, illness, sickness. I've, I've done this and this and that. I've, I've prayed. I've come to the God wants you well. I've listened to healing messages. I'm listening to it. I'm in it, but it hasn't gone yet. And again, those are kind of hints that if you haven't done all those things, then you certainly need to do them, you know, because you want to be able to say that, right? <laughs> At least say that, right? So, okay, well, what's the solution? Keep on doing it. 
being diligent, take diligent heed. That's the warning, that's the admonition, to take diligent heed, financial strain. You know, I've given, I've given out of a need. I've given more than I've ever given in my whole entire life. I didn't really have it. And I'm still battling financial strain. Well, what are you supposed to do? Keep giving, keep sowing out of your need, keep focusing on the word, keep speaking life words, keep speaking truth over your situation. That's what that diligence means. The job call still hasn't come. Oh my goodness, in the natural. Time is running out. Well, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> Stay diligent. Keep speaking those things that be not as though they were. Keep speaking the word of God over your situation. Keep decreeing and declaring that it is so. Not walking in doubt. Not getting in confusion. Not speaking words that are against what the Bible and what God has said about your situation. That's how you respond to that. And then, oh my goodness, uh, strife. You know, unfortunately, there are some people who literally deal in their marriages with strife. And, you know, we've come to the marriage maintenance. We've been to the, we've been to all the marriage retreats, <laughs> you know, all of them. And either, you know, my spouse still won't come to church with me or we still don't get along. We still can't communicate well. Now what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Stay diligent. Stay diligent. Because, again, remember, it is Satan's perfection professional occupation to cause us to be in doubt. That is his goal in life. That's his only purpose is for us to be in doubt, for us to think it's never going to change, for him to continue to show us things that are the complete opposite of what it is that God has said. And when we know that, we have to continue to fight against it. We beat it back. We cast down those imaginations. We use the tools that our pastor gives us week in and week out to make sure that we continue to walk in victory, continue to speak the word, continue to say those things that be not as though they were, continue to get excited about it, continue to believe it, to remain steadfast in our faith. That's what we do to remain diligent. And oh my goodness, <laughs> uh, brothers, after five weeks of the life group, we had four. Y'all had five. <laughs> you, know, you know, I felt some kind of way about that, but, you know, brothers will give it to you. Man, I've been through five weeks. I'm still battling these thoughts. I'm still battling urges. What you do? Stay diligent. Review the material that you've learned. Continue to maintain accountability um, as we're supposed to. That's what we do. We keep diligence, and when you take diligent heed. This is what it means when you hold tight, cleave. I love the word cleave, hold tight. If you don't hold tight to something, it drops. If I wasn't holding this tightly, it drops. If I'm holding it tightly, you know, as strong as brother Dave is, if he tried to take it from me, I'm, I'm not letting it go. I'm holding on to it. I'm holding on to it. The Bible wouldn't tell us to hold tight if it wasn't necessary to do so. Think about it, you know, people... You know, I'm saved, so I should never have to worry about nothing anymore. <laughs> you know, in this life, we have tribulations, right? The Bible tells us that, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. That is what, that is what we're responsible for doing. We hold tight to the word of God and what God has said. We don't let it go. And, and the need for diligence is all throughout the Bible. I mean, all throughout the Bible, in different ways, it tells us to be diligent. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that has promised. That's telling us to be diligent. It's telling us to hold fast again, you know, hold fast. Wind's going to come. We hold on. We're not going to, don't let go ever. Don't ever let go. Um, the C clause, I like the amplified version of Hebrews 12 and 1, let us run with endurance and active persistence the race that is set before us. If you, if you didn't need endurance, he wouldn't tell you to, to run with endurance and persistence because you wouldn't get tired. So obviously, if you're getting tired and it requires endurance, that means there's a pressure that's there. But we just continue running with endurance. Uh, Matthew 24, 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Again, you have to endure. That requires persistence. That requires that diligence. A and B clause Amplify 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Love it. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, always doing your best 
in doing more than what is needed. Now that's diligence, that's persistent, always excelling, always doing your best, and oh my goodness, not more than what is needed. It don't say do just what you need. It says more than what is needed. So you can't come to church too much, right? That's not too much. I don't care what it is, it's not too much. Because we're doing more than what's needed. You read the word all the time. There's other books you can read. It's not too much. You listen to somebody preaching all the time. Not too much. You're doing more than what's needed. That's, that's so good. We don't look, and I love the New Living Translation of 2 Corinthians 4.18. We don't look at the troubles we can see now, whether we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Oh my gosh, if we fix our gaze on the fact that the troubles we see now will soon be gone, to God be the glory. That is a wonderful way to stay in persistence. If I told you right now, I promise you, I promise you that tomorrow your financial troubles will be over, would you be sad right now? You wouldn't be wondering what's happening right now. Your countenance would not be down. You wouldn't be in discouragement. Well, what, if I told you that, why do you believe me more than God? That don't even make sense, actually, when you're just kind of using logic, <laughs> right? So we're, we're focusing on what, the things we don't see. So we're going to take diligent heed, follow the pattern of the Reubenites, Gadites, Gadites half-tribe of Manasseh, and the Israelites. What did they do? Joshua 22.2, they honored their pastor, their leadership. They followed instructions. They did exactly what Joshua told them to do. They followed instructions. Joshua 22, 4 through 5, they actually focused. There's a transition. They were in victory, but then he told them to, be, to, to, to take diligent heed. So it's important for us to stay sober and vigilant. We have to make sure that we are understanding our enemy and staying sober and vigilant to stay in faith. And then Joshua 22, 5, commit, hold fast to what the Lord has said and hold fast to his promises. So the alternative to diligence is giving up. Giving up equals failure. <laughs> we don't fail at KCC. We don't do failure. We only win. Amen. What do we do? We win. Amen. We win. Amen. Well, let's get on our feet and just exhort the Lord our God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. God, we just thank you. We thank you for